Assalamualaikum and good afternoon to all UKM citizens and those from Universitas Pajajaran, uh, Bandung and Universitas Indonesia, Jakarta. Plus, good morning as well to our friends who are joining us from across Indian Ocean, uh, from Indra Gandhi Memorial Hospital and Maldives National University, Malay and Maldives. Welcome, selamat datang. I am uh, Dr. Muhammad Maya and I will be your moderator for this session. Um, firstly, before I forget, I would like to thank uh, the Higher Management of Faculty of Medicine, UKM, uh, for making this uh, webinar possible, especially to our esteemed Dean, Professor Raja Fendi Rajahli, and of course, uh, Professor Rosina Abdul Mana, uh, our de Academic Deputy Dean for Undergraduate Studies. Also, a big thank you to the support uh, of the technical team, uh, Mr. Buhari and Mr. Haji Zanudin. Um, the currently ongoing COVID-19 problem has affected all of us worldwide, uh, massively in every which way. Uh, not just uh, the healthcare sector, but also the economy and, also, and especially for us in the academic institution, the education. The way each of us act and react uh, differs. However, like it or not, all of us have to adapt and change accordingly to uh, suit the situation. Today, we have with us four uh, panelists uh, who will present, and they are actually from different areas in the Faculty of Medicine, UKM, and they will be sharing the challenges and adaptations they have faced in these recent, recent weeks. Uh, these challenges are not only in terms of clinical service, but also uh, education. And to our audience, uh, the Q&A session will be held uh, following the last presentation, the fourth presentation. But you, you can always post your questions, comments, or views in the chat box uh, at any point in time. We will be there and we'll get, that, we'll get to them. We will try our best to answer and respond to your questions and comments. So let's start with our first panelist, Dr. Sham Suryani uh, Jamal. She's a senior lecturer and consultant in the emergency department uh, at the Hospital San Sanjay Kuala, Kuala Lumpur. She is uh, actually the one in the member of the pioneer group of UKM's emergency medicine uh, postgraduate program. Currently, she sits in the Council of College of Emergency Medicine Malaysia, and she is one of the faculty members of the International Training Committee for American Heart Association here in Kuala Lumpur, UK. Dr. Shamsi Rani will be sharing with us the experience from the aspect of the frontliners who will be the, the first to be in contact with the patients who come to the emergency department. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Surya as the first speaker today. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Muhammad, for the generous introduction. Um, let me share my uh, slides. Right. Okay. So I'm going to share with you today uh, on some of the challenges that we face as a department and frontliner and our experience in handling it and adapting to it. So um, this is a picture of our department. Uh, so as you can see, um, for those who have not uh, been here before, um, uh, our department is here, you know, the one that I showed on the arrow. So we actually received about um, 200 patients a day. Um, and this is how busy uh, we can be on a certain days. So sometimes um, the department uh, is just full of patients, relatives, as well as um, our own staff. So regardless whether it is COVID or not COVID, um, we have still to attend to all the other emergency cases. They still come and they still continue. Um, so for example, patients who will still come in for um, post-trauma, post-motor uh, vehicle accident, acute stroke, and others. Therefore, um, one of our biggest challenge that I feel um, is to actually balance out between uh, providing our services as usual, um, but as well as to ensure safety for our staffs and also our patients. Um, I'm going to share a video of the interview that I did uh, to our staff uh, on how they actually feel 
um, about their challenges uh, working as the frontliner? Yes, challenge here is to learn how to adapt to our uh, new system and also the new norm. For example, we, we cannot incubate the patient like how we used to do, and we cannot give uh, nebulization as a as what we used to do to everyone. Also, we have as a nurse manager, the challenges is to make difficult decision to safeguard my nurses welfare while trying to follow the orders. So the biggest challenge for me will be uh, to to don and uh, doff. So because of our limited PPE, so um, when we need to go to the washroom or because of the PPE will get hot, so we'll get dehydrated first. As a medical assistant, now as a frontliner, I'm not quite worried because we have, we have a well-trained uh, to handle the disaster situation. But as a mother and uh, I have a family, I'm quite worried about them. The biggest challenge is wearing a full PPE and working in the hot weather. So one of the few challenges that I faced so far during this pandemic is I cannot go back to my hometown in Sabah because all the flights uh, have been cancelled and rescheduled. So. Yeah, so um, as you can see, um, all the staff have their own worries and fear, um, but um, they still have to balance between, you know, whatever they are feeling or whatever their problems are and being professional and actually turn up to work. Um, so that is also a challenge by itself. Um, just a bit of a background on uh, what actually happened on the ground. Um, a week before uh, 18th of March, which is um, the time that the date that we started um, um, movement control order, um, we as a department started to receive patients with um, atypical uh, acute respiratory illness symptoms. So they are very suggestive of possible COVID likely. So at that point, we feel that our current um, setup um, are actually not safe uh, for our staff and also our patients. So hence, we decided um, to actually restructure our department. Um, and therefore, on the 14th of March, we plan and we uh, propose to the hospital management. And with the support of um, the hospital, we're able to create um, three zones in our department by 18th of March. So we divided our department um, into three areas, uh, which are the PUI area. Uh, these are designed for patients uh, who are under investigation, according to the Ministry of Health um, guidelines. And we have also Zone A. So Zone A are actually for patients who do not meet the PUI criteria, but they could be possibly COVID. So that the, there are high risk of um, uh, COVID infection. Uh, and zone B uh, for other patients who are low risk of COVID, um, who comes in with the, you know, the, the normal trauma, you know, burns, um, surgical emergencies, and that sort of thing. And um, the level of PPE on these three zones are also different. Uh, for example, Zone B, uh, the staffs only wear um, uh, Level 1 PPE, whereas for PUI Center and uh, the Zone A, uh, minimum is a Level 2 PPE uh, by itself. So that, in a way, actually saves um, the usage of PPEs. Right, I'm just going to share with you a few pictures. Um, so if you remember um, the early picture that I showed you earlier, how pretty our department is, so this is how our department looks like now. Uh, it's bundled up in uh, blue canvas, uh, but still very pretty. Um, so we've, uh, and our hospital actually um, support, uh, able to support us and actually help us in um, establish the area. So this is the, our primary triage, or our triage. Uh, previously, our triage is inside. Uh, so due to the uh, pandemic and um, itself, we actually, brought our triage to be in front, outside the department. So when the patient uh, comes in, uh, it's very important. Um, these people here the, would actually sift through the patient and decide whether the patient goes to PUI, Zone A or Zone B. So they are very, very important. 
Um, so this is inside the zone A. We do not have a negative pressure room, uh, but what we did was that we convert our normal recess, which have a closed and closed uh, door, uh, to become our zone A recess. Um, this is an area for the semi-critical zone A. Um, each patient will be put into an um, individual cubicle uh, with partitions. Uh, so hopefully that will reduce uh, the risk of disseminating the infection. Um, zone B is a bit different. You can see um, it's an open uh, area. This is previously our observation ward. Um, so the one, uh, the only thing that um, actually isolated the patient from each other is only a curtain, and the staff here as uh, using a level one PPE. But it's okay because the patient that goes here are low risk patient, and uh, we would like, you know, we get a lot of helps and assistance from the NGOs. Uh, um, so this is a, a, a tent that was um, being um, don, uh, sponsored by an NGO to help us to establish our non-critical um, zone B patients, yeah? um, you know, patients who comes in with uh, cuts, bruises, you know, that sort of thing, swelling. So they will be seen here. Um, this is totally outside the department itself. Right, so this is an entrance to the PUI center. Okay, so this is an, a PUI area. Again, it is outside the department as well. So all these things that is outside the department is quite hot. Um, but uh, yeah, we've got fans and also uh, portable air cons and air coolers. Um, but still, it's quite hot for the staff. Um, so they see patients here uh, who is patient under investigation. Um, there's a the orange tent that you see is a, a disaster tent that we already have. And the critical patients are seen in there. We've got it equipped with all the intubating equipments, monitors, and that sort of thing. And at the back of this tent, um, there's an area to see a non-critical patient and also a separate donning and doffing area. Um, so along with the changing of the structure, uh, we also um, have to modify our triage checklist, our guidelines, SOP and algorithm to fit the changes. Um, we have about 200 staff uh, in the department, not inclusive the interns. So in order to disseminate um, the information to all our staff, uh, we really rely on the social media, just a simple WhatsApp with the daily updates. Um, we develop few important procedural videos. Uh, for example, the one that you are seeing on the monitor now is a video that we develop on how to intubate a COVID patient. Um, we feel that this is the fastest way that we can actually disseminate the information, share it on YouTube and share the link with all the staff. Um, and follow through with an online CME. So, um, um, so these are some of the adaptations. Um, so apart from the video itself, um, as I've already um, explained earlier and um, you know, said multiple times, um, PPE and PPE and PPE. So we have... Um, 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 actually inform our staff the importance of um, them um, using a PPE um, and not to actually um, uh, harm themselves by approaching the patient um, without any PPE. Um, so as you uh, listen to the previous one of our doctors actually saying, you know, you actually have, they actually have to change their mindset. They have to um, make themselves safe first before they actually approach the patient itself. So another important uh, part is actually training of the staff. Um, it is important uh, because um, there are, nev there are uh, new techniques that has been incorporated into our procedures, um, like the common procedures that we do. For example, the rapid sequence uh, intubation. So we have dedicated a team who set up a simple training module and staff were scheduled in a small group, less than five people, to ensure the social distancing. Um, to go through the training module. And the training modules that um, we develop, develop are, for example, the rapid sequence intubation modules, cardiac arrest management um, of patient, and as well as donning and doffing. So um, just spare me a few minutes, uh, not even a minute, just a minute, uh, to share with you another video on our staff uh, sharing um, their experiences working as a frontliner. 
at one point I was actually in quarantine. So it was a say it was like very lonely and I cannot go out to do my stuff also. And then on top of that I also uh, the biggest experience I think is actually I could see the whole transformation of our emergency department into like another zone. I did not know that we can actually open up so many spaces and we have such a big search capacity that we can uh, deploy. As a wife and a mom, uh, it's a great effort to make home safely and to make my family safe and comfortable. Because that, uh, in the, our emergency department setting, you, usually when patients come in with a critical and uh, acute uh, state, we usually want to respond to the patient fast. But uh, in this uh, situation, we have to take a step back and then we have to think about our own safety and our, also our staff's safety. So When our staffs were down because they have been exposed to positive COVID-19 patients, so they have to be quarantined for 14 days and all the, all the other staffs have to be on standby and they have to to make overtime uh, on call um, and then, then from the uh, sacrifice their um, actually go through uh, some of them being quarantined, um, you know, and so hence other people has to actually cover. Uh, there's one point uh, before the restructuring um, on the fort on the 16 or 18 of March, whereby we had a two COVID positive patient who actually um, passed through um, and uh, be treated in our um, emergency department. At that point, we have not restructured yet, and um, as the consequences of that, we have. Um, 30 staff, uh, we, are, we are 30 staff down because they were being quarantined for 14 days. So that, that, is, um, that is really an experience because we have to pull staff from other departments, get help from other departments um, to actually make us continue to provide the, um, the service that we're providing. Okay, um, last but not least, um, uh, this is one of the project uh, in um, the department, what we call as, as relax copy or relax. Uh, Kopi, um, I mean, for our, um, our colleague in uh, Maldives, uh, Kopi is actually coffee. Okay, so this is relaxed and coffee. Um, uh, it's headed up by one of our colleagues, uh, Dr. Kaldun, who is very specialized in making coffees. So what he did was that he uh, brought in a coffee machine from um, his house and um, it becomes a special project uh, to give some motivation um, to the staff. Um, so a, a session for them to actually relax um, and enjoy. Um, so something for them to look forward to when they actually come to work. Um, so they can uh, bring a cup uh, or bring a mug and they will be able to get a free coffee. So, um, and as well as um, I would like to, um, the psychiatry, the Department of Psychiatry also assist us, um, whereby they arrange an, a stress uh, relaxation um, uh, time uh, for the staff um, every Tuesday and also Friday for about 15 minutes. Um, so they educate the staff on how to relax themselves and avoid being stressed and that sort of thing. So yes, um, um, so I would like to end my presentation by saying um, thank you everybody for the attention and I would like to thank all the emergency department staff, um, the hospital management as well as the NGOs. Um, without them, uh, I don't think we'll be able to pull through um, during this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Surya, for your interesting aspect on uh, those who are serving in the emergency department uh, during these trying times. It's nice to see that um, you actually provide some support to your staff as well. Uh, to our audiences, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, post it in the, in the chat and we will get to it uh, after the last presentation. Uh, next, I would like to invite the youngest member of our panelists today, Dr. Alif Saifuddin Mohamad Shukri. He is the final year postgraduate medical officer currently undergoing his training in Masters in Internal Medicine in the Faculty of Medicine, UKM. He has a special interest in hematology, 
and is currently conducting a research about COVID-19 infection and its effects on uh, coagulation parameters. Uh, Dr. Ali will be talking about the suddenly new and modified practices that have had to come into place um, because of this pandemic. And he may have a different perspective because not only is he a medical doctor, but he is, he is also a student in this institution. Uh, please proceed, Dr. Ali. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon to all the audience. Um, so my name is uh, Dr. Alif Safuddin. Uh, I'm a final year postgraduate student, uh, master's in internal medicine from National University of Malaysia. Uh, before I start uh, with my presentation, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to deliver the heartiest thanks and uh, uh, to convey my sincere gratitude to all these names, our infectious disease consultant, Dr. Patrick and Dr. Najma, uh, Prof. Nulaila, Prof. Wanapisa, Prof. Halim, Prof. Sharul Azmin, Dr. Ku, all respiratory consultants, medical consultants and specialists and all members of uh, medical COVID-19 team uh, for the guidance and valuable experience throughout this, uh, I would say, difficult period of time. So this whole experience and this presentation will not be possible without the help from uh, all of you. So today, uh, I am given, I am given the task to share with all of you um, about my personal experience uh, as a postgraduate student uh, in managing COVID-19, uh, specifically in internal medicine department. So uh, we will look at the challenges that we face, um, how we adapt, how we move forward, and what are the lessons that can be learned uh, from this uh, whole experience. Uh, so before, um, before I start, let's have a look at the chronology of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, at the end of December 2019, um, the clusters of pneumonia cases have been reported in Wuhan, and um, the causative virus uh, for the pneumonia was identified to be a novel coronavirus. And since then, it has been spreading to uh, the whole China and uh, later spread to every corner of the world. Alif, can and you share your screen, please? Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay, is that okay? Okay. Okay, is that okay, Dr. Maya? Okay, I'm so sorry. So, uh, so again, um, uh, on 11 of February uh, uh, 2020, the disease has uh, officially named uh, COVID-19 uh, with the virus officially named as SARS-CoV-2. So uh, as the virus uh, continued to spread to all over the world, our country, Malaysia, has reported our first uh, COVID-positive case on the 25th of January. And unfortunately, unfortunately we have our first uh, COVID-19-related death on the 18th of March. Um, so looking at, at, at these events retrospectively, um, with the growing numbers of the uh, positive cases in Malaysia at that time. So we know at one point uh, in our hospital, we will have, we will encounter our uh, uh, positive COVID-19 uh, cases and effectively to manage them. So the decision at that time uh, to, to prepare very early uh, was proved to be a very uh, good decision. And as it happened on 18 of March 2020, we have reported our first case and uh, on 26th of March 2020, the first positive COVID uh, patient was ad ad admitted to our uh, COVID wards. So, um, with the COVID-19 reaching our doorsteps at that point of time, closer uh, and closer day by day, uh, there were a lot of, uh, I would say, anxiety among uh, the staff and among doctors in particular. So, um, this feeling uh, of anxiety is, of course, uh, because of the fact that, as we all know, COVID-19 is uh, very uh, uh, highly infectious and because there were many reported cases of healthcare uh, infection uh, that were reported uh, from other countries at that point of time. So there were a lot of, uh, I think, uh, uncertainty in the situation at that time and uh, the concern uh, among doctors for safety is, uh, of course, inevitable. So the biggest challenge uh, at that time was uh, how to set up a new system and absolutely a new uh, working environment where patients uh, can still get the best treatment whether or not they are COVID-19 positive or not. And at the same time, the staff can work uh, in a safe and secure environment. So um, in order to adapt uh, to these new needs and to ensure the safety of our staff, uh, we decided that uh, our new norm, okay, uh, everyone talk about our new norm. So our new norm in internal medicine uh, department is to change the way we approach our new cases. So uh, in order to make sure that the all admissions uh, were managed correctly, so we have created a system whereby uh, all of the uh, new patients to be classified according to their COVID-19 status. 
so we have uh, wards for COVID-19 patients. Uh, uh, all the non-COVID-19 cases will be admitted to a general medical ward as usual. And patients with suspected COVID and fulfill the criteria of, uh, for SARI will be isolated and tested for COVID-19 in dedicated uh, SARI PUI wards. So um, another aspect uh, that is, uh, I think, uh, very important for me to highlight is the role of a core and dedicated team to manage the whole situation. So in the beginning, because of the sudden and uh, I think unexpected rise of this pandemic at this massive scale, um, we have to start uh, technically from scratch. So uh, the formation of the COVID-19 team, uh, which involves uh, not only from medical personnel, uh, but also non-medical personnel, is a very important step, uh, I would say, uh, to make sure that the system in place uh, is working. Uh, and uh, from my own experience, I think uh, the formation of this dedicated team that includes uh, all level of uh, uh, specialties from consultants, uh, uh, specialists, medical officers, health officers is very important because we can directly learn from, um, uh, from them, from the consultants, from the specialists. And I think this is a very valuable lesson that we hope that we can, we can bring uh, forward uh, once we start our service to, to the country. Um, talking about COVID, uh, our COVID-19 wards in uh, medical department, so uh, we receive positive cases from uh, various sources. So uh, other than the positive cases that uh, were de detected from our own lab, we also uh, accept positive cases from different task force, uh, from different health office. Um, so to accommodate uh, these growing numbers of COVID-19 cases and emissions, uh, seven wards have been converted to uh, COVID-19 wards. Uh, with total number of beds of 108. And as for today, uh, in total, cumulatively, we have uh, 206 patients that were admitted and received treatment in uh, our uh, COVID uh, wards. Uh, and Alhamdulillah, uh, we have not only uh, medical officers from a medical department to manage these patients, we receive a great support and great help from our colleagues uh, from other departments, from ENT, orthopedic, ophthal, FMS, and also surgical department, uh, and also, let's uh, not, uh, not forget uh, staff nurses from pediatric department, from um, operation theatre that come and help to make sure that the burden is shared. So I think <clears throat> the whole system that was created uh, will never be successful without this full support and help from uh, all the departments. And um, I also would like to highlight here the importance uh, of a coordinated effort. So, uh, the admission process of a COVID-19 positive patient to the ward uh, should involve um, many teams. Okay, this is of course to ensure the safety uh, of the patient and also the safety uh, of all the staff involved. So this is when uh, the role of security officers to safeguard and uh, to secure the pathways of the patient is very important. And of course, after uh, the patient being discharged, um, the role of the housekeeping team to make sure that the area is clean and disinfected is, is very important. Um, so the, uh, the initial challenge to ensure the safety of all staff is guaranteed, I think, by the creation of this system and the support uh, that we have. So in terms of um, uh, academic, I think um, this COVID-19 pandemic um, have uh, provided us with many possibilities and uh, uh, opportunities to learn a new um, knowledge. I believe all doctors who have been involved uh, in the management of COVID or SARI patients, uh, they have acquired uh, a lot of new skills, you know, such as uh, doing a proper way of oropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal swap, uh, the correct way of putting PPE, how to don, how to doff, and of course, uh, the, the proper way of doing hand hygiene Okay, which I think is very important to our um, daily work uh, as a doctor. Um, and of course, uh, this pandemic also has opened up uh, many chances and possibilities to conduct new research uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms of the uh, continuation of learning process, this pandemic has given us exposure to a new method of uh, learning using e-learning or online learning, uh, such as using Zoom presentation. Um, overall, I think as a postgraduate student, I sincerely believe that um, this unexpected event of COVID-19 pandemic has given us uh, a chance to gain valuable experience and, and also knowledge on how to face and how to manage a crisis or, or a medical disaster. 
Uh, I think this is a very important lesson as such event, even though it is not commonly happened, but proved to be very challenging and very difficult, uh, not only in the setting of the hospital, but at a global level. So um, the only thing that uh, I think, um, maybe not entirely positive with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, to the program is of course the, uh, the, the longer duration of the training. And I think um, this may be relevant uh, as, uh, as we all know, the uh, four years of study uh, involve a lot of sacrifice and commitment. And um, I think, uh, uh, yeah, there's a lot of arrangement need to be done later on. And of course, uh, for some for students who are recruiting their patients and uh, still in the process of conducting their research, the movement control order have also restricted the movement, uh, patient's appointment and visit to the hospital. So uh, I think uh, as a conclusion, uh, this whole experience of a COVID-19 pandemic uh, has given us uh, a student a valuable and important knowledge, I think, on how to set up a system uh, and how to face a medical uh, disaster and also crisis. Uh, it also has uh, taught us that it is very important to form a solid, a functional, a dedicated team uh, to face the crisis and of course to uh, be prepared and to anticipate the challenge uh, that, 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 that would come. So I think uh, with that, uh, I end my uh, presentation. Yeah, with uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alif. Uh, that was very enlightening. It's, um, it's nice to see that, that um, those who are uh, involved in the managing this kind of situations are not just the doctors. The flow chat that involved here are uh, other people as well in the organization. Thank you very much for that. Uh, our next panelist, Dr. Aliza Muhammad Yusuf, has been practicing as an anesthesiologist with a special interest in intensive care medicine since 2011. He uh, currently has completed a three-year fellowship training in intensive care medicine to become a full-fledged intensivist. Uh, I would like to inform those who do not know that there are not that many intensivists in Malaysia. Okay? So she will be uh, one of them. Uh, she's part of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine and Academy, a worldwide platform uh, that exchanges views uh, in terms of current updates of intensive care medicine. She's also involved in organ donation innovative strategies for Southeast Asia. The short name is ODC. Okay. Apart from publications, she, she actually has won two, not one, two first prize awards in uh, 2016. In World Congress of Anesthesiologists in Hong Kong. Her main interests are airway management, strategy in mechanical ventilation, extra corporeal membrane oxygenation, and open ventilation. I would also like to point out here that during this pandemic, she's actually doing extra work. Uh, she's actually attending uh, two hospitals, two ICUs, one here in uh, Hospital Tansele Tongkumu Chris, and the other is Hospital Sungai Buloh the full COVID hospital in Malaysia. So she's gone there to look after the critically ill COVID-19 patients. Dr. Aliza, the stage is yours. Thank you, Dr. Mohamed, for the, such a kind introduction. Uh, let me share my slides first. So today I will talk uh, on my personal challenges in dealing uh, um, uh, with COVID-19 from the critical care perspective. Obviously, there are a lot of challenges and for the purpose of presentation, uh, I have highlighted a major few. The first and foremost, the challenges that I have encountered is definitely changes in intensive care unit setup. So as our institution are catering for both COVID as well as non-COVID patients, so then in order to open the COVID ICU, we had to relocate our non-COVID patients to a specific designated areas. Um, and in order to do that, definitely it needs a meticulous planning as well as um, a manpower to transport the critically ill patients. On top of that, our team also have outlined the COVID ICU plan. And as for the plan, we have to make sure that the, uh, we provide the safe environment to the healthcare worker, meaning to ask 
as well to our nurses and the rest of um, um, the, the rest of the team. Um, despite of providing safe environment to us, we also need to provide an easy access to the patient's care. You see, all these patients will be in isolation. Therefore, we need to design in a such that when the patient run into trouble or they are having any of um, acute hemodynamic disturbance, then we had we could have an easy access and could be you know uh, able to manage them. On top of that, we also need to look into the equipments, our equipments as well as our bed capacity. Uh, in order to run two ICUs hand in hand, um, and our ICU team also had to look into a manpower. Um, it's very easy to be burned out as well as providing a substandard care when you do not have enough manpower. And definitely for the COVID patient, we need to look into a specific uh, whether we have an access to a specific medication. So how do how do our team adapt to all this? we do optimization of resources, definitely. And then we communicate with a lot of teams. We cooperate with a lot of teams in order to open up the COVID ICU and definitely being resilient in order to, to, to achieve the common goal. Now, the thing is that I've, um, I would like to give my thumbs up to the ICU team, meaning the COVID as well as the non-COVID. Because when we first receive our patient, it was just a floor plan. But we managed to bring in our first patient in the last 24 hours into a COVID ICU. And all this would not happen without um, a discussion as well as, um, uh, you know, cooperation between all teams. So the second challenges that I have gone through, definitely we're talking about um, not just a local issues, this is more of a worldwide issues whereby there's a limited numbers of personal protective equipment or PPE. And this definitely not the issue of funding, this is more issues of manufacturing as well as delivery of items to us. So in order for us to um, be able to assess the patient safely, then we had to have a few rules in order to try to reduce the PPE wastage. So we adapt by minimizing numbers of healthcare personnel that are attending to the COVID patients. And this healthcare personnel must be the person that preferably can make an impact in the patient's management in the next 24 hours. On top of that, we also had a timely contact for the nursing care, meaning that the moment when the nurses go into the isolation room, then they will do multitasking from um, delivering medication to um, blood gas analysis and as well as uh, positioning of the patient. Um, on top of that, we also try to adhere to our um, um, PPE use based on the recommendation. Now, the third challenge is obviously related to the patient's, um, patient's management. Um, it, it applies both to COVID as well as non-COVID patients. As for the non-COVID patients, I found that they came late to the hospital. So instead that they have a single organ impairment, now they probably end up with multiple organ failure, which com complicate matters. And I think mainly they did not come to hospital because they also had a fear towards COVID-19. they rather not to be in hospital, they rather be at home. So that's for, non-COVID patient. As for the COVID patients, obviously the cause of a disease is unpredictable. It is um, very difficult to predict um, the cause of an illness um, in COVID as the patient can deteriorate very fast or they could also improve for a while and then deteriorate. The classical management that we thought about managing patients with pneumonia cannot be applied fully in a patient with the COVID-19 pneumonia, um, simply because they have a different pathophysiology. So in a way, I think that the treatment is more personalized rather than protocolized. Um, we need to be vigilantly reviewing their numbers as well as their data in order to predict what could happen to them in the next you know, a day or two. Uh, clinically, also, I found it more laborious because they have a specific measures to it, such as prone positioning, 
you might need to do a prim positioning in a patient who is very hypoxemic. And at the same time, um, we need to be vigilant in terms of checking the lines, checking the decubitus ulcer, so that they wouldn't end up with morbidities. And I must say that this illness also is very isolating. In a way that when they are being diagnosed, they were isolated to the point that when they are very ill, they have no access to their family members. They only have access to us, and even as us as a healthcare worker, we are wearing PPE. They can't see our face. They can't even understand what are we saying inside the PPE, basically because of our voice is, you know, being, when you wear PPE, obviously your voice is not that strong for the, another person to hear. So it is very difficult in a way, and most of the patients end up with depression. So then what do we do about it? Then how, how do we lessen our, our you know, their, their agony as well as their feeling of depression? So we try to have as much of a human contact as possible, even though we are in a PPE suit. And in the patient whereby we think that the, they might not make it or in a way whereby the cause of the illness have shown such a negative trajectory, then perhaps we will um, call family members by doing a video call, a phone call, and we'd rather do it early. We'd rather doing it repetition, in repetition, rather than just once off information because it's a very to have a closure for the family members when the patient pass on if we do not have a repetition information. So the next, the last but not least, obviously is to overcome own fear. Obviously, as a person like me who had to work uh, in the very sick um, with a very sick COVID patient, um, obviously I have fear, and I have been um, uh, involved uh, previously in SARS and also in MERS-CoV. But I can tell you that the fear is not real compared to this one. I think it's mainly because there's so many things that we do not know about this COVID-19. And definitely when you do not know a lot um, or you have uncertainty, it will create a lot of fear. So in a way, I uh, deal with it in a different perspective. I look at it, I have faith and I look at it uh, as if that it is just a face and like any other face, it should be um, passed on soon. Uh, at the same time, I also do a volunteer work, working along with my colleagues, and that sort of uh, boosts up the morale of being together and having a feeling that it's not just me, but there are also the rest of the people also fighting COVID and, and try to make them better. So um, before I end my presentation, I would like to show this diagram um, with you, to you, yeah. It shows uh, which zone are you in during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. I was from here in the fear zone and now I have outgrown to the growth zone. And I hope that all of us um, were now in the outer layer, uh, able to achieve maturity in our own decision pertaining to this pandemic. And uh, hopefully we can end this um, pandemic together. So with that, I thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aliza, for your experience in managing those who are uh, in the, during the critical phase, those who needed me mechanical ventilatory support due to coronavirus. Um, I think everybody everybody had their, their fear zone at one point. It's just whether we've progressed along. That's the issue. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Aliza. Um, can you uns unshare your screen, please? Uh, last but not very least, I would like to introduce Professor Dr. Mawada Azman. He is a surgeon and associate professor working in the ear, nose and throat department, Hospital Chancellor Tongkumu Chris, Faculty of Medicine, UKM. As an educator, as a lecturer, she has had seven years of experience teaching ENT to both undergraduate and postgraduate students. Now, the gear will now shift a bit for this webinar. The previous three speakers uh, have been talking about the uh, changes that they, they, they had to impose in terms of clinical service. Uh, Dr. Mawada 
uh, is actually going to be sharing with us the trials and tribulations uh, radically in radical undertaking of the conduct of online clinical teaching. Thank you very much. So, Maada, the stage is yours. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad, and I would like to welcome our friends from Maldives and Indonesia, and I would like to thank the Faculty of Medicine for the opportunity to talk today, and I'll be talking about how the pandemic has posed challenges and allowed adaptations in our teaching and learning methods. Yeah? So Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, I'm Dr. Mawada Binti Azman and as a disclaimer, three months ago I did zero online teaching. <laughs> so I'm very new at this and I would like to thank these individuals who have helped me in my humble journey. You can see all the pictures, nice pictures there of the members of the faculty who has helped me. So starting March 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic has created a state of emergency and this has prevented our conventional teaching and learning methods. So as a lecturer myself, I faced challenges to continue to deliver our contents and um, I had to deliver it in a way that I've never thought of before. Yeah? So of course, um, our faculty has provided platforms. In our case, it was uh, UKM Folio and Moodle and I was not familiar with this platform. And it has caused a great amount of anxiety because now I have to part with my usual lecturing with uh, online uh, with PowerPoint presentations. So additionally, the undergraduate medical training had to resume fast because they have a very compact academic calendar. So um, I don't have a lot of time. Another challenge that I faced was um, before the pandemic, I was not very familiar with all these technologies. I was not a YouTuber. I, I don't have high-end webcams. I don't have my microphones and as for the students uh, 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 on the students perspective they too are very limited for example the students are already at their hometown and in certain parts of Malaysia we have very limited internet bandwidth and the students have limited devices to work on with so amidst all these challenges I was the coordinator for the three weeks undergraduate ENT course and I find myself adapting by learning and experimenting and familiarizing myself with all the various platform and work with the limitations that we have. So in this presentation, I'll share some of these experiences. So first and foremost, I made use of the various clinics provided by the faculty to learn how to prepare online teaching materials. And of course, I supplemented this with some materials that I found online. So after that, I tried to simplify it so that <laughs> being a coordinator, I need to convince other lecturers in the department that we can actually do this online teaching. So um, here's a representation of our course content on the UKM Folio. This is an institutional um, repository and thanks to the wonderful effort by all the lecturers in the Department of ENT. So we made it easy for the learners. The topics are arranged sequentially according to the timetable, along with instructions for all the topics in the course. So all the lecturers are free to decide how they want to conduct online teaching for their respective topics. As for my own topic, I revised my lesson plans previously in a form of one hour lecture and for online teaching, I got the two hour slots, so that's a big yay for me. So my priority was to go with low bandwidth online class because I do not want students left out from limited internet access. To me, it's just practically not fair. And I am not a patient girl and many times I've stopped downloading files from the internet when it just took too long to download. So if your files are big, it's not going to work. So, um, working on the objectives, I made five micro-teaching videos. So, if you do not know what micro-teaching means, these are basically bite-sized videos. They are about five minutes or less and they are on the topic objectives only. They are not elaborate and the students are asked to read around the topic. So, for the full lecture content, I already have the slides. I just insert audio voiceovers to cater for proactive learners with better internet access. So previously, I used to ask questions to random students, usually those sitting at the back or trying to doze off, just pick them and then ask questions so that I can consolidate my lecture content. So for the online session, I can't do that. So I included 15 OBAs on my topic and I made it compulsory for all the students to answer as proof of attendance. And these three contents are uploaded to UKM Folio, which is our institutional platform. And here's the quiz performance for the first batch. This is fresh from the oven about three weeks ago. So you can see that I was very happy that about nine of the students got full mark and I got an average mark of 75%. So questions were conducted through WhatsApp web 
And on top of that, I had extra time to do some virtual team activities through Pear Deck to improve engagement of the students. So um, how did to get the micro teaching videos done, yeah? how did I manage to do this? So initially I had to experiment. Um, so what I did was using the microphones that I already have, I started filming myself on Microsoft Teams. And you can see a slight peek of how it's done initially. This is the inferior cabinet and you can see the middle cabinet. So at the left one is the wall between the middle cabinet so there's also a feature on Windows 10 that I've made uh, use of. It's a game bar feature. You can find the link there. And um, here's another example. And this was recorded using screencast o -Matic. This is a free app. So the micro teaching videos are attractive. They are high definition images there. Of course, the streaming is smooth and they have very good audio quality. So what I did with all these videos, uh, I uploaded the videos into my Google account as a YouTube link. And then after, after that, I shared this as a page in UKM Folio. So it's important to do this because it'll come out very nice, the topic on top and all the videos here. So the students just click and play. So at the bottom of this video, I inserted a link for the um, full lecture. So for the full lecture, it was prepared on Google Slide and I inserted audio recordings in MP3 format. It is important to use the MP3 format because it will reduce the file size. So I use a free voice recorder app on my phone and what I did was I record an audio file for each slide and then after that I inserted it at each slide and set it as auto player. So um, because after this, uh, all the Google Slide is going to be shared uh, via a link at UKM Folio. So it is important to make sure that all the audio files sharing setting is set as public for, for that so that your students will not need to ask permissions from you before um, viewing the audio slides. Yeah? So after this, you'll see a 10 second example of the lecture slide with audio. So although the audio is less rich compared to videos, I think this is a cool way to share a lengthy full lecture with learners since the resultant file becomes very small. Yeah? So um, what happened during the day I delivered my online class. I was on call on the day I was supposed to give a lecture. Before rounds, I took a selfie, posted on WhatsApp what the students should do. And you can see on the WhatsApp trail that I've posted there. Mm -hmm. After I finish my rounds, the students are already working on the flashcards. So it's important to keep on motivating your students, um, tell them what is going on. And then after that, you can see me rejecting some of the flashcards and giving feedback to the students why it is rejected. Then I compiled all the accepted flashcards so that the students can keep as lecture notes. After that, I provided feedback on the quiz that I posted on UKM Folio. And then I give opportunities for the students to ask queries, uh, any questions pertaining to my lecture, and I give explanation through WhatsApp web supplemented with clinical images. So I think many here are familiar with this dissonation between synchronous and asynchronous teaching methods. So synchronous methods using Zoom live streams and even webinars such as this, they are real time and they are more lecture-like and natural, but they are burdened with high bandwidth. So if they have, let's say you have a student who is in Sabah or Sarawak, they may have low internet connectivity and they will not be able to hear your, your voice as smooth. So um, on the other hand, asynchronous methods such as uploading materials for students, although they are highly accessible and uses less bandwidth, but they are criticized to be less effective. So in my case, what I tried to do was use both methods, synchronous and asynchronous, but I prioritized low bandwidth. For example, I used synchronous question and answer sessions on WhatsApp. It is real time, but to reduce bandwidth instead of streaming, I type and shared pictures on WhatsApp web. So the pair deck flashcard is done synchronously where students work in pairs to produce notes for the topic. It's real time and low bandwidth. Embedding audio files in slides allowed a more natural lecture-like feeling, but it is delivered asynchronously with low bandwidth too. 
Of course, the students can visit your contents regardless of the schedule if it is delivered asynchronously, similar to the YouTube videos. So personally, um, my perspective is that I think we should be creative and embrace each platform for its advantages to suit our content instead of sticking to either synchronous or asynchronous methods. So I've got some remaining time, about one minute. So I need to tell you about Microsoft Teams, if I may. So I ran some virtual clinics with my students three weeks ago using Microsoft Teams. And on the example of the video on the left-hand side, I posted a patient with a complaint. And the students are asked regarding relevant history pertaining to the complaint. We are testing their clinical reasoning. Yeah? And um, here I can like their answers, correct their mistakes, and wrap up with a model answer. Yeah? We can also include images. For example, on the right-hand side, you can see some radiological findings that I posted so that the students can interpret them. So I also used Microsoft Teams to demonstrate clinical findings of the ear, nose, and throat. And this is done by using high-resolution images. So in Microsoft Teams, we can share big files, unlike what we can share with UKM Folio. So apart from that, you can relate with common investigations. In our case, it was the audiogram. And we can explain to students um, what are the findings and how we derive the findings to the students. Yeah? So as we are doing all these teaching and learning activities, Microsoft Teams keeps track and chart our channel analytics. And here on the right-hand side, you can see that uh, my channel analytics for my small group discussion, the dark purple bars are representing the posts that I've given to the, to the students, the triggers. And the light purple bars are the replies that students have given me. So you can see that students are being very proactive and responding to the triggers that are provided. So in conclusion, definitely my teaching methods have changed in the setting of this um, pandemic in which I see active learning as a big advantage compared, compared to conventional face-to-face -face lectures. And sometimes the students just doze off during your lecture time or they are there physically opening their eyes but they're not listening. And even clinic sessions and uh, usual clinics tend to be very busy and we tend not to concentrate on what the students are thinking about. We cannot test their, their clinical reasoning and I think this uh, virtual clinic by Microsoft Teams has given me more opportunities opportunities to explore um, the, the students' thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Mawada. I, uh, I'm certainly amazed that uh, from, uh, from a newbie, you've actually, uh, uh, actually have become an expert now, so I think you can teach all of us after this. Okay? Uh, that's the last of the presentation, so we're, just, we're going to open the, the chat now. There's a question to Prof Mawada. Uh, most of the time, does poor connectivity to internet affect the e-learning process? I think uh, not to the majority of the students. Uh, we have a minority of the students, say around um, uh, 10 to 20 in my group. I have a group of 43 students. So 10 to 20 students do not have good internet connectivity. But to me, it's unfair to disregard them. So um, if let's say we're, trying, we're using synchronous method, we sh should be judicious and take into consideration that these students are being left out. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, um, I would like to ask something to all of all of the panelists. I mean, um, you've been exposed to the patients, positive or negative, or those who are actually under investigations. Is there anything different when you get home? How you how you react or engage with your family or children? Have you made any changes at all? Right. Okay. I think I think I'll I'll, I'll answer first. Um, yes. Um, uh, but you know, um, me working in emergency department, it has always been my practice to um, actually when I go home to um, uh, to take a shower first before I actually hug my kids and that sort of thing. That has always been a practice to me. So it does not change much. But I do know that um, most of my MOs um, would actually um, shower first before they go home. And also the staff nurses and that sort of thing. So one of the things that we have to think about um, uh, initially is actually to install um, a hot shower um, in the department itself, for them to actually shower themselves before going home. Yeah. 
Okay. Any comment from the other ladies and uh, Dr. Ali? Uh, well, uh, is this the same for me? Yes, um, uh, uh, let, 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 let. I shall I shall appreciate yeah <laughs> so I think I think it's the same for me so basically yeah we do shower so I will shower at the premise where I have reviewed the patient then um, before I meet up with my family so I shower another time at home uh, basically when I work in Sungabul hospital it's a mandatory thing to do after you have reviewed your patient then you immediately have to shower before you actually mix mingle with other people yeah yeah, I think uh, for me, uh, I have to agree with uh, the, uh, both of uh, both of them. So basically, it's definitely we have to clean ourselves uh, before we go home. But I just want to add uh, in internal medicine, I mean, especially in COVID wards, what we do is that um, we uh, we have a system whereby we provide a logbook. Uh, so every time a staff come, whether doctors or staff nurse, they have to uh, check their temperature um, before they start to work and before they go home. So I think um uh, this is actually to you know in some some sort to uh, make sure that uh, you know they are they are uh, we have a question to sorry but i uh, i think there's a problem with your connectivity um we have a question for prof Ma, uh, from Mawada here from Aida. Well, uh, before start and after oh sorry we, we have a question to Prof Mawada uh, from AIDA. Thank you for your uh, inter, uh, for interesting uh, sharing. Would you mind to share on how you prepare for online teaching? What sort of preparation do you do? <laughs> so I've uh, talked earlier on, so I, I had at the back of my mind, I planned my, my lesson plan first and I included elements that I wanted to include. I, I already had it at the back of my mind. Then after that, um, what I do is concentrate on mastering each techniques. For example, I wanted to have videos, so I experimented with videos. I wanted to have um, a lecture with audio voiceover, so I experimented with that. So I set my priorities, do my lesson plan, plan it out and then work on each of the materials. Um, uh, if let's say you want um, a link to my slides, I can provide it and I will put it at the chat. So I think there you would find um, some of the um, shortcut keys that you can use on your laptop and even use the shortcut keys on Windows 10. If you don't own a MacBook, you can do some, some of the activities of screen recording there. So there was another question by Prof. Roslina and it was about um, the cards. Uh, Prof. Roslina wanted me to explain regarding the flashcards that I use to engage students. So basically because um, I had a two-hour lecture session so I had an extra one hour to do some group activities so I wanted to find ways how to engage the students and make them uh, learn more. So um, what the uh, Pear Deck app does is if you go to um, a flashcard factory by Pear Deck, um, if let's say you allow, I can share my screen and I'll show you the, web, uh, the website. So this was the website that I went through. Yeah, it was the flashcard factory by Pear Deck. So what I asked the student to do was they log in, they uh, enter using a game code. It's free basically for the educators and also for the students. And once they log in, they will be randomized into two groups, the night shift and, and the uh, morning shift, and they will be paired. Uh, so um, each pair will work on a set of flashcards. So what I did was because I had to cover um, common conditions causing stridor, so I had them draw some of the um, conditions causing stridor and the other um, pair will write on the clinical features. So uh, um, after the activities, uh, what I do is I just accept or reject the flashcard. So if the students give incorrect information, I reject. And then after that, I put it up at the WhatsApp saying that, oh, you are rejected because your content is not right. Yeah? Um, and uh, the flashcard is, if the flashcard is accepted, um, it can be compiled into a nice PDF so that we can give to the students and it becomes a lecture notes. <laughs> Um, because I'm sharing um, my lecture via Google Slide, so the students cannot download 
<laughs> That's very important because I'm sharing clinical videos, images of patients. So I don't want the student to download. They can only see, but they can see many times. So that is the beauty of it. They can go back to the content over and over again, but they can't download. So they bring back the flashcards, which is their own work. So thank you. I shall st stop sharing there. You can't stop just yet. There is another question for you. Oh, okay. I'm becoming very popular today. It's a challenge to change from traditional teaching. So yeah. Do you think that the online method should continue even after the, the pandemic has ended? I think to teach theoretical knowledge and clinical reasoning, I will definitely continue this because I find that I can engage the students better with this technique. Um, I, can, I can get sort of uh, an idea of how the group is performing instead of just picking on certain students and asking them whether they understand the topic or not, asking them to ask questions or asking them questions, quizzing them. So, but um, with this, method i can i can basically sample the whole class i know how the whole class is doing so i can then concentrate um uh, the deficiencies that the certain students might have so um the students with lower marks i just contact them and i say what's going on you forgot to read the lecture what something like that <laughs> okay so i think i will i will continue to 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 do this uh, teaching this way even though the covid 19 pandemic has passed because i think it's effective for, for my topic but for clinical teaching Teaching, for example, teaching physical examination, yeah? um, uh, going to see patients, professionalism, communication skills, I still have doubts about online teaching. Perhaps I need to attend more webinars and see more professionals and how they do this. Perhaps I'll have more idea then. Another question to the, to the famous girl today. How do you plan to conduct PBR session? <laughs> Uh, just now I shared in Microsoft Teams how I conducted small group discussion um, that was on a virtual clinic. So PBL sessions also I do through Microsoft Teams, uh, but I don't, basically in PBLs we've got stamps, uh, probably as a short clinical vignette. We give it to the students, let them discuss, and then after that we conclude, then after that move on to another stem and, and follow through. So I think PBLs is something that is wonderful. You can do through Microsoft Teams. And um, I've experimented. It's, it's good, but you need to spend a lot of time. So um, because ENT, we are limiting our clinics. I don't get to operate. I've not been operating for two, two months now. So I have the time. I have the luxury to, to do all this with my students. Uh, but I'm not too sure. Later on, after the pandemic has passed, I think we will be slightly more busy. Maybe I can do this. Um, of after office hours, lah. Um, just now, I think Dr. Surya mentioned in a slide saying that uh, the nature of the management has changed. Yeah? You cannot nebulize anymore. Is that still happening at the moment, or has things moved on back to before? If you nebulize patients who have asthma. No. So basically, um, um, with the pandemic and the COVID-19, so um, even studies have shown that, you know, nebulization and there's no difference in the hospital admission rate um, between patients who are being nebulized or patients using MTI with a spacer. So um, uh, uh, I guess uh, that's, uh, that's the good thing about this is that um, finally uh, we are forced to actually change to an MDI with a spacer. The only limitation that I see um, is that um, our uh, community or even the, uh, our society are not um, the expectation, you know, when they come to the hospital and they've got um, bronchospasm, they expect it um, to actually have a nebulization. So when the expectation is not being met, um, met uh, so that, that's where the, we have a problem. Like now, what we do is that we explain to them that, you know, um, when we do nebulization, uh, if uh, somebody else, uh, the, 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 if you are impacted or you've got the virus and you don't have the symptoms, um, it will stay longer in the air and it will be risky to other people. So they seem to be um, uh, accepting that. Um, yeah, so, but I don't know after this, uh, but um, the other thing with um, uh, changing it to an MDI with a spacer is that um, we, 
uh, our society, most of them does not have a spacer at home. So when they come to the hospital, um, it's either we provide them a spacer or they have to buy wine. So that is another limitation that, you know, um, that we have to look at. So at the currently, what we are doing is that we've got, um, we bought some of the spaces and we're giving it to the patient for free. Um, and also we, um, with the help of the pharmacy department um, they, and also the respiratory unit, they actually invented uh, or innovate a spacer using um, a mineral bottle, um, um, a yeah, 500 mils mineral bottle, and that actually helps us as well. So we're using it now throughout the department. Yeah. Um, Aliza, there's a question for you. Okay. You, you mentioned that the problem now, the non-COVID patients, they become more unwell. Do you, do you feel that they are actually also a victim whereby they are certainly uh, the not topical because COVID-19 is very topical at the moment so they get priority. So those who have like heart attacks or uh, and the rest, they probably just get not optimal management. Well, I guess then um, in overall, I think it is not a good time to get sick, basically, um, uh, besides then having COVID. It's not the suboptimal management. I think mainly because the patient they themselves, they do not want to come to hospital in this time. Um, uh, in a way, then um, uh, we also have seen cases whereby as simple as a bronchial asthma, they probably have, you know, has been sick for quite a good four or five days being a breathlessness before come to hospital. So in a way, um, um, I think then the, the person who are um, providing care to the patient, they are actually like in KKM, they have volunteers that are actually working in a non-COVID hospital. And there's also volunteers that are working in a COVID hospital. And as of for us, we also have a team we're divided into two, which is a COVID team as well as a non-COVID team. So the people are there. There's no really a lacking in terms of a manpower. Um, it's just that when the patient came in, they definitely have more organs that's been involved. Um, so that's, that's my comment on, on that matter. Yeah. Prof Mawada, there's a question. Uh, how many students do you have in your Microsoft team teaching? Um, so for the general students, I make one channel, which is a general channel for all the students in the batch. So triad is about 43 students. So for that channel, I included, um, so because some of the lecturers wish to have their sessions via um, Zoom. So I uh, once they have finished their sessions, I just embed the session into YouTube video and then after that I shared with the general group so that um, the students who are left out they can still go back to the materials in case if let's say they have poor connectivity when the other lecturers are giving uh, their lectures through synchronous method they still can get back to um, the materials so um, that's for the general uh, channel uh, 43 students and then I created small groups in channels in which um, these groups we work with their supervisors so some supervisors um, find comfort uh, find themselves comfortable working in Microsoft team but some do not so those who are comfortable using microsoft teams they use microsoft teams those who are not uh, will use other channels so for the small groups is about uh, three to five students so the videos that i've demonstrated that is for my small group that consisted of three students okay thank you mawada there's a question that is open to all um, the question is may i ask is majority of hospitals do not have negative pressure room even in the operating theater does COVID pandemic push the hospital to prepare a specific area for negative pressure rooms? Anybody can answer? No, there's no such preparation to uh, cater for COVID-19 patient, meaning that uh, so far they've been to the other hospital, they just make do what they have. Uh, in a way, um, only one hospital that really being equipped with the NPR or negative pressure rooms, which is in Sungai Bulu, but the rest of the uh, places are actually still normal pressure room. And in a way, uh, we had to, um, you know, um, had to still treat the patient even though we do not have the modalities. But uh, uh, in order, 
the, the concern about the negative pressure room is basically uh, for us to do the aerosolized uh, procedures such as intubation, extubation and that kind of thing. So in a way, uh, as long as you have a PPR in place and that should be all right um, and that should have, um, you know, offset the, the issues about the negative pressure rooms. Thank you. The next question is uh, for Prof. Mawada. I think this is from the, one of the undergraduate students, Ahmad Asim. He's asking, uh, how would you compensate the, the lack of the clinical skills, especially in postings such as ENT, requiring special tools like otoscope, yeah? which they, they cannot do this at home? Yeah. How, how so I agree. Um, I think that is the biggest challenge that we face. When the students go back to their hometown, they did not bring their otoscopes and it's difficult for us to, to teach them clinical skills and uh, um, for them to demonstrate whether they are acquiring the adequate uh, skills or not. So what we did was um, we have a video um, otoscope or video autoendoscope and we tried to use this video autoendoscope to demonstrate to the students what is actually they are seeing um, along the way. So it's not a very fast video, we make it very slow so that uh, the students appreciate, okay, step by step, what you should do um, uh, to to make the extended artery canal aligned. What are you seeing? How to maneuver the otoscope so that you get a, a nice view of the tympanic membrane. So we have this video, and we've shared this with the students, and uh, they have access to this. So um, they. They already have the theoretical knowledge, so we still have to compensate by seeing them performing it. So we still need to have some face-to-face -face, um, teaching and learning with our students. Perhaps, uh, maybe we, if let's say the pandemic has not passed, we may need to do this on a mannequin or have uh, probably a teddy bear or, or, or something so that we can we can uh, see the students basically demonstrating all this and in fact uh, we i think the faculty will be giving us some remedial um, time so that we can cover these very important aspects that we missed out in online teaching thank you for the question though for mawada somebody's asking whether postgraduates can access you can follow as well um, postgraduates for UKM Polio, uh, currently they cannot access, um, but for Microsoft Teams, um, <laughs> so before um, recruiting the students for uh, undergraduate students, I experimented by recruiting postgraduate students because uh, basically postgraduate students, they are Yes, yeah, always there uh, in, in our department and um, they very they welcome all this um, online clinical teaching. So uh, initially I created another channel for the postgraduate students and we had some classes there. So um, I know how to troubleshoot and so for then only I uh, utilized it for the undergraduate students. For UKM Folio, currently I think um, uh, the postgraduate students will not be able to access. Uh, however, we are working on this. I think uh, the team from uh, Active Learning or Pengajaran UKM is working so that uh, the postgraduates can also have access to UKM Folio. Correct me if I'm wrong, Prof. Roslina or Prof. Tong. If there's any, any mistakes, we'll, we'll let the rest of the uh, faculty know. Uh, there's a question for uh, Dr. Surya. Uh, you, you are complimented with the excellent presentation. The question here is, here is do you think this uh, PKPD or CMCO uh, will help us to further flatten the curve since the society expected, are expected to be more responsible and wise after being cooped up for so long? Mm, okay, I think that's um, uh, a very difficult question to answer. Um, well, uh, Personally, as a healthcare worker, as a frontliner, I would like the PKP um, to be prolonged. Um, you know, um, um, just, just by experience, what we have now here in ED today, um, the sudden surge of patients. Um, so whatever that you see on my, you saw in my presentation on the first two slides, um, it is looking somewhere near that already. So this is not good you know, for the hospital. Um, uh, I don't know about, because um, this is the first day. Uh, so when I came to work this morning, um, the, the road is still clear. Um, I don't know um, whether, you know, um, it's go still going to be clear on my way back. Um, I've heard news that uh, my staff who just um, travel to shift at 2 p.m. It's already jammed. Uh, so, um, um, 
I do want to uh, believe that our society um, is more responsible and more wise um, and not go out and actually um, go shopping for Raya and that sort of thing. Um, but um, I don't think we're there yet. Um, um, I think um, if we, uh, with the opening, with the, with the sudden opening and um, somebody, people might get uh, really um, panicky and they will go out and just in case that we will close again. Um, so that will actually cause surge of um, infection, I think. But we will, not, we will not know about this until in the next two weeks, um, just near the Raya. Uh, then only we will see, um, you know, all these um, patients uh, whereby whatever they've caught during this, the next two weeks, we will see it in the next, yeah, just before I hear. So I'm not sure, but I personally um, doesn't really agree for the uh, PKP to be lifted yet. I think, I think a lot of clinicians uh, agree with you that it shouldn't have been lifted so fast yeah, because you suddenly see a, see a surge of people on the road this morning. Um, there's a response from uh, some of the attendees that the, the platform of UKM Folio can be used for Postgres. It just you need, need to uh, be able to access it and also to upload some material. Uh, there's a question for Dr. Surya who wanted to know what's the percentage of healthcare workers in ED who has been affected uh, the COVID-19 or, or confirmed as positive cases, UI has to be quarantined. Okay, um, for our department, I cannot um, tell about the rest, but for our department in our hospital, um, we, alhamdulillah, we do not have anybody who's, uh, any of the healthcare worker who is positive uh, or contracted uh, positive COVID. We've got uh, staff being quarantined, um, as I explained on, um, uh, on the earlier uh, in March, in the mid-March, we've got um, two positive COVID patients and the staff are not properly, uh, does not wear proper PPE. Um, so that's considered as breach PPE. So they, um, they have been quarantined. Um, but uh, luckily with the zoning and everything, um, the, the, the staff, that there's still stuff that being quarantined, but it is lesser. For example, for one patient who's COVID positive, um, less than five staffs are being quarantined. Uh, you know, so so um, so far we feel um, with the when they use PPE adequately, um, they should be safe. I would like to pose a question to Dr. Alif. Uh, personally, how do you how do you uh, do you think your training is okay at the moment? Do you feel sad that you have to spend extra time being delayed during the final year? Anything like that? Well, uh, I think uh, it's a quite difficult uh, question to answer, uh, to be honest, uh, because I think uh, there's a pro and cons uh, in 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 uh, postponing or. Uh, prolong the, the duration. Of course, for some students who are affected um, uh, in a sense that they cannot uh, conduct their research, of course, this can be, you know, uh, important for them. But for some students who supposedly finish their training and, like, for example, finally completed their thesis and have presented uh, or, or soon to present their, uh, their uh, thesis and uh, go for VIVA. So, um, the delay of the six months uh, is uh, quite long uh, for them. So um, it's a difficult question to answer, but um, six months can be too long for some of the uh, students, I would say. Uh, there's one question about uh, assessment okay? uh, from Dr. Chai. The MMC has deemed that clinical skills should not be assessed via online. Is there such as an innovation where this can be partially done, such as a, a synchronous method? Maybe Dr. Pramawada can answer this. Um, I, I've read the question, Chai Eng, so I think it's a very good question. So 
um, uh, I think we are not ready for this. I mean, assessing patients, um, uh, students' clinical examination skills via online because we don't have the equipments. For example, I've seen um, in, a, in a webinar whereby in Australia, they used um, a virtual space in which there is a webcam in which the students are asked to examine. There's a mannequin. So we don't have all these facilities. So for us, I think we are basically not ready. We are not there yet. But what I've done with my students is um, uh, they, they have teddy bears at home. I've asked them to demonstrate the clinical examination onto a teddy bear like um, a simulation similar to that but it's not a form of assessment I think we are not there yet in terms of assessment uh, uh, if let's say we are trying to see whether the students uh, know the flow in, uh, for examining the students I've put up usually I put up clinical images eh, on uh, as a share screen on PowerPoint uh, of a finding for example a neck mass there's a mass there and the students describe the findings on the PowerPoints but they demonstrate it on the teddy bear that's something that we can do perhaps in our setting with the current technology that we have. I'm sorry, I can't answer the, the question. But the slide is referring to the, to the new uh, virtual teaching tools that we have, the DXR initiative. Uh, if used, okay. Um, DXR clinician, yes. So, um, I've used uh, the extra clinician for the batch, the, the, the previous batch of students that was three weeks ago. We used that for case write-up. So we um, narrated a case um, for a particular diagnosis and randomized the students and assigned the students to clock these cases on um, the XR clinician. Definitely it can be done. But um, the feedbacks that I got from the students are not very good. Number one, mm, uh, this, the, the information keeps on missing. So they have to redo the, the whole thing all over again. You know, in the exercise clinician, you have to answer the history, then physical examination, then do assessment, then investigation, plan, and then that's the evaluation. So the students find that it is lagging and sometimes the information just went missing and they have to redo it again. And um, uh, it, so to because of we actually did not know um, we are not familiar with the SR clinician before we just started with this batch so what we asked the student to do was clock the patient on the SR clinician and provide like a case write up format um, do the whole introduction history physical examination and submit it as a written report for us to create so that is usual for our continuous assessment but to use the SR clinician as a platform to assess the students we actually need to expose the students to this platform first because the students are not familiar with it they, they just tell me and hey, doctor this is the first time you're using this and we are experiencing a lot of difficulties and um, I think it's not fair for us to do that to make this as an assessment platform but um, probably we need to familiarize the students first uh, let them use the DSR clinician over and over again if they are familiar then probably we can explore this now that's my view face to face right sorry Dr. the moment nothing can replace the, the face to face so. yeah certain things you cannot replace certain things cannot be replaced any other questions sorry. I am muted. Okay, uh, it's nearly four o'clock. Okay, <laughs> it's a very, very fruitful session, and uh, I would like to thank uh, everybody who posted the question. I know this is an online platform, it's not like a live seminar, so you won't be able to hear the, the clapping sounds. So I would like to invite all the attendees to to join me in thanking all of our panelists for a job well done. It's been very interesting. Okay, uh, for a short, short uh, last minute procedure, it's been very. Um, uh, so for short last minute preparation, it was very well done. I would like the opportunity to acknowledge all, everybody who uh, had worked tirelessly in combating coronavirus, regardless where they are, okay, or what they do, in each uh, of uh, his or her own capacity. Um, it was not possible, I apologize to some who, who cannot be included in the seminar, it was not possible to include every scope of the work done by every member of the faculty. Okay, because everybody, in the department, in the faculty of medicine, uh, has has done their job. They are doing a great job uh, during these trying times. Um, I apologize for any technical problems. Okay, I've been told I have a cricket near me. There's like a clicking sound, which was not there when when we tested yesterday and uh, uh, earlier the uh, noon. Um, I would like to thank all the audience for joining us and making this enjoyable session. Uh, each of us has a role to play in combating COVID nineteen. 
Uh, I see our esteemed dean there uh, has his video on. Would you like to say a few words before we finish? Thank you. Uh, well done to all of you. Uh, love it and hope a lot of people can learn. And um, stay safe, cool, relax, chillax, do whatever needs to be done. That's all. Thank you, uh, everybody in Malaysia, Indonesia, Maldives. The fight is not yet done. So stay safe, everyone. Uh, thank you. Have a good day. Goodbye.